The next time you dare to dream of a white Christmas, pray you are not granted such an extreme one as was to experienced in the winter of 1894. For that Christmas brought with it a monumental stinker of snow, the culmination of a decade of harsh winters, referred to by British climatologists at that time as the Little Ice Age, and not without justification. It was to be the last of the wicked winters of the 19th century. Southwesterly winds dominated the first three weeks of December, but it was not until the last ten days or so, when the winds veered to the northwest, that the colder weather arrived, bringing first frost and ice, then snow showers, and finally the blizzard that was to rage on for days, blanketing the British Isles, including rural Norfolk, where our curious story takes place. The incumbent of Hardwick Hall was Sir Harrington Hardwick, the famed newspaper magnate, who had increased his family fortunes exponentially by championing the yellow press and promoting lurid stories featuring crime, corruption, sex and innuendo. It had meant that the family coffers were replenished and money was now no object. He could indulge himself at will, and on this festive occasion, he had indulged his only daughter Beryl's whim and engaged those theatrical doyens, famed on two continents, Sir Robert Errett and his widowed sister and legendary cohort, Lady Fanny Godiva, and brought them to their stately home to perform a Boxing Day production of their two-handed drawing-room comedy, Bob Geruncle, Fanny Gerant, for the edification and entertainment of the family, staff, and local dignitaries alike. The pair, having fortunately arrived just as the first flakes of snow drifted down from the heavens, were now safely ensconced within its hallowed walls. The night before Christmas Eve found them in the front parlour, the esteemed company cut off from the outside world by the unremitting snowfall. Having retired after a sumptuous dinner, Actor manager Sir Bob Everett stood before the blazing log fire and regaled his sponsor with some of his choice theatrical anecdotes. Harrington Hardwick appeared highly amused as he puffed on an obscenely long Cuban cigar. His timid yet doting wife Clarissa, being somewhat distracted, leaned forward, crystal cut bow in trembling hands, attentively trying to catch the ash before it fell to the carpet. Their only daughter, Beryl, was clearly entranced by the glittering company, her face aglow in rapt attention. Her fiancé, Percy Maycock, however, his broken leg elevated on a pool, and encased in plaster as a result of a fall on black ice, was less than impressed. His face bore a pained expression, which might have been explained by his ailment, but for the fact that in reality it reflected only his deep disapproval Thespian inclination. Sir Bob reigned supreme before an otherwise captivated audience, recounting a particularly hilarious tale of having once had to share a bed with Sir Henry Irving and Bram Stoker, whilst on a theatrical tour in the Alsace, when, all of a sudden, he was rudely interrupted by a great gust of wind that hurtled down the chimney, forcing the flames to rise up and devour the Christmas fuel and setting fire to the seat of his dress pants as they did so. It was only Sister Fanny's quick thinking that avoided disaster by dousing his ample posterior with a jug of mulled wine. As Sir Bob retired with flaming cheeks to recover his dignity, and, once the parlour maid mopped up the carpet, the rest of the assembled party found that they could finally get a word in edgeways. Fanny observed the portrait above the mantelpiece, and remarked on the beauteous figure portrayed there. Harrington Hardwick plucked the cigar from between his teeth and wagged his head sadly. Poor Amber, he began. My great-grandfather's eldest sister, and mad as a box of frogs by all accounts. Thwarted in love, you see. Always a delicate creature. It tipped her over the edge. How very grim, Fanny remarked. I'm sorry I asked. Then, after a pause, she really was rather lovely. 
Not really, Harbury Carums. Appearances can be deceptive. He considered his cigar. Let's just say it is a rather flattering portrait. The artist taking certain liberties, I understand, at the behest of my great-great-grandfather. His eyes flickered momentarily towards his exceedingly plain, weak-chin progeny. You will appreciate that a father will go to any length to nurture and protect his children. Percy wins, though whether by pain or implication it was unclear. An uncomfortable silence ensued, and it seemed to Fanny that all previous sense of fun and conviviality had been sucked unceremoniously out of the room and up the chimney breath. It was in that subdued atmosphere that the company made their excuses and retired for the night. In her opulent guest bedchamber, Fanny later sat before her dressing-table mirror, reflecting on her awkward faux pas as she slathered her face with the liberal application of restorative cold cream. She brushed her long golden tresses by candlelight, counting out the obligatory one hundred strokes she performed every night prior to her slumber. However, she had barely achieved sixty-nine before she was interrupted by the hollow sound of tapping in the chimney stack behind her. The solitary candle flickered. A shadow darted past the corner of her eye, and she scarcely had time to turn her head before finding herself confronted by a ghastly apparition at her shoulder the face of which blurred into insignificance so transfixed was she by its bulging green eyes, flecked with white veins like two hellish gooseberries on store. In horror, she immediately sprang to her feet and made a dash for the bedroom door, but found resting with the knob was to no avail, as it was resolutely held fast. Overwhelmed by mortal terror, Fanny fainted and fell like a collapsed concertina, upon the plush Axminster shag pad. Awoken by the gong announcing breakfast, Fanny found to her amazement that the bedroom door was strangely ajar, and, after composing herself and hurriedly dressing, she made her way down to the breakfast buffet, still rattled by the events of the night before. Morning sunlight reflected off the winter panorama, ricocheted off the deep snowdrift, that pressed halfway up against the three tall windows that stretched from the floor to the ceiling in the breakfast room, dazzling the interior. Fanny took a seat at table with her back to them, and over a plate of kedgery she recounted the previous night's curious events to Hardwick matriarch Clarissa, the only other resident yet to rise. Clarissa set aside her bowl of prunes, placed the spoon down, and, as she listened intently, appeared to grow increasingly agitated before begging to be excused, claiming she had to go up to the bell tower to polish the brass as a matter of urgency. But, Fanny observed, that did not explain her clutching a lace handkerchief to her flushed cheek as she rushed out of the door. In solitude, Fanny contemplated the odd events, but Sir Bob, Harrington, Beryl, and Percy soon replaced Clarissa at table and distracted her. The conversation was somewhat strained, however, as Percy's ill temper appeared to have been exacerbated in also having had a disagreeable night due to his aching leg and his makeshift bed set up to accommodate his injury in the chill conservatory and could not seem to contain his acid comment about the illegitimacy of the stage and the hysteric who make their living from it. Beryl finally snapped in the face of his ungallant behaviour, accused him of being a prig and a hypocrite. Apologising to their guest, she stormed out tearfully. A red-faced Percy then rose with difficulty to his feet, with the aid of crutches, excused himself to hobble off and spend a farthing. Harrington Hardwick appeared oblivious to the unfolding drama, and tucked into a plump, spicy sausage with obscene enthusiasm. Young love, eh? he observed with a chuckle. Bennell, such a lovely name, Fanny observed. Named after the precious gemstone, I presume. Ah, well, she is my gem, Harrington replied, 
fondly shuffling scrambled egg into his mouth. Greek name, don't you know? Conceived on our honeymoon in the Adriatic. He looked thoughtful. Clarissa and I married late. I'd almost given up on the thought of having children. In the event, we just had the one, born of love. My Beryl, my precious jewel. The tender silence that followed was shattered abruptly by a hideous scream emanating from the water closet in the downstairs cloakroom. Harrington and Sir Bob leapt to their feet, rushed out into the hall, and proceeded to batter down the closet door, but, as the wooden panels first cracked, then splintered and finally gave way, they found to their alarm and amazement the closet empty, save for an ominous gurgling in the water pipe, with no sign of Percy, with or without his farthing, only his abandoned crutches. Percy could not conceivably have hobbled further, yet he was nowhere to be found. A brief search of the ground floor proved futile. The anxious cries of those assembled elicited no response. Despite Fanny's ministrations, a distraught peril was not to be comforted, and she left her to the care of her poor mamma in the parlour when Sir Bob discreetly requested her company. She stood, looking out of a window in the study to which they had retired. The snowfall was unremitting. Bit of an odd do-what, Sir Bob remarked, as he closed the door behind him. Yes, Fanny replied distractedly, and no hope of police intervention in the matter. Indeed, Sir Bob replied gravely. Strange that Beryl seems quite so distressed, perhaps. I mean, they hardly strike me as a happy couple. Fanny looked startled. It was strange for Sir Bob to show any interest in anyone outside his own sphere. It was a pleasant surprise and gave her hope of his ultimate redemption. Sir Bob went on, and Sir Harrington has more than once expressed his protective nature in regards to Beryl. I'm sure you will agree. Are you suggesting, Fanny replied inquisitively, that he had a hand in the disappearance? Possibly. But we were all in the room when Percy disappeared. Not all, Sir Bob observed. Clarissa was absent. But she's a complete milksop, Fanny ejaculated. True enough, Sir Bob replied, drugged and changed the subject. Fancy a brandy? As evening drew on and the blizzard continued to range, the mystery remained unsolved. Fanny was to conclude that, Snowden, with no chance of escape or assistance, they must sally forth into every nook and cranny of heart recall in search of the missing Percy. Unlikely as it was that Percy had left the ground floor unaided, with candles ablaze and held aloft, Fanny and Clarissa headed upstairs while Sir Bob, Harrington and Beryl, having regained a modicum of her composure, ventured downstairs. Fanny quickly came to realise that the higher they ascended, the more jittery Clarissa became, until, as they finally reached the staircase to the attic, she could contain her foreboding no longer, and refused to go a step further. I suffer from vertigo, she cried, and cannot go one step higher. Puff, Fanny retorted, and bunked. You went up the bell tower to clean the brass just this morning, or so you claimed. All right, all right, if you must know. Clarissa fell to her knees, her body racked with sobs, and confessed the long-held family secret of Amber Ardwick and her sad and sorry demise. For the sin of loving a man not of her father's choosing, Amber had been incarcerated in the attic, and driven mad with longing, and had died on Christmas Eve one hundred years ago that very night. On her deathbed, she was said to have sworn to have her revenge on the house of Hartwick and all who sailed in her, and the man she had so loved, the one who failed to rescue her, was none other than Percy Maycock's very own great-grandfather. From behind the attic door, the slow, rhythmic creaking of a rocking chair on bare floorboard squeaked unmistakably. Scurrying up the stairs and throwing wide the door, Fanny was met with a scene of such unmitigated horror she thought she might die on the spot. The full moon shone through the skylight, illuminating a wild-eyed amper who was rocking to and fro, 
an unconscious Percy seated on her lap and plucked at her breath. Her visage resembled the oil painting, but as one whose varnish had cracked and praised beyond restoration. A great waving and gnashing of teeth were replaced by a burst of maniacal laughter as she caught sight of a trembling fanny, and with a triumphant streak of supersonic proportions, Amber's head spun three hundred and sixty degrees as the rocking quickly intensified. Faster and faster, back and forth, it seemed to shake the very foundations of Hardwick Hall. Fanny jumped back to avoid the crumbling chunks of plasterwork that crashed down from the ceiling, and the very walls themselves began to collapse around her ears, and she yelled until her lungs felt fit to burst. Having interrogated the servants to no avail, and explored the wine cellars at length, Harrington, Beryl, and Sir Bob now found themselves in the scullery, caught up in the maelstrom. Pots and pans flew hither and thither, as the agar upended itself, killing the Christmas turkey without so much as a gobble. Finally, with a terrible cacophony of sound, the building imploded. Then silence then ensued. The storm had broken. A light dusting of snowflakes drifted down from the heavens and fell upon the ruins of Hardwick Hall. Then slowly, very slowly, the survivors begin to emerge from the rubble and gather on the forecourt. Tiny Tom Scratchy, the pantry boy, pointed up to a bright, shining star in the night sky. Core, he said, before raising his high-pitched camera sweep to send the opening line of the timeless Christmas carol, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Hesitatingly at first, the servants began to join in and emboldened a dishevelled fanny linked arms with the Bob, Beryl, Errington, and Clarissa, as their voices swelled together, reaching a crescendo as, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, O oh, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. A single solitary pick hurtled down from the stars above, landing on poor Tom's head, knocking him unconscious. As Fanny and Bob darted forward to check on Tom's condition, Harrington slipped an arm round his wife's trembling shoulders and sought to comfort her. Never fear, dearest heart. We are fully insured. I'm not daft, he reassured her, drawing his daughter into a shared embrace, oblivious to the sinkhole that had opened underfoot and swallowed them both. Mm-hmm.